Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome, a very warm welcome to the second annual State of the University Address. My microphone from this angle sounds very loud. Am I shouting at you, or is it good? It's good. All right, excellent. Uh, my name is Valerie Hennetuk, and in addition to serving Concordia University of Edmonton as Vice President, Academic, and Provost, I'll be your MC today. I'd like to start by acknowledging that the land on which we are gathered is, of course, Treaty 6 territory and a traditional meeting ground, a place of learning and home for many Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, and Nakota Sioux. Next, just a couple of quick housekeeping matters. First off, the event is being live streamed, so please govern yourselves accordingly. Uh, in, uh, in the main, please do make sure your phones are on silent. That would be very helpful. Um, following the State of the University address, we, there will be a, an opportunity for some question and answer. My colleagues will be coming around with microphones, and if you can please use the microphones to ensure everybody hears the question, that would be extremely helpful as well. And of course, if we don't get to your question, or if anyone in the room has follow-up thoughts at any time, do not hesitate to contact the president directly, Dr. Tim Lorman at president at concordia.ab.ca. He would, of course, love to hear from you and engage further after this event as well. Please note there is a class starting in this room, starting immediately at 1 o'clock. So we will need to vacate very promptly following the event. I'll do my best to keep us on time. But if everyone please remembers to exit promptly at the end, I know you'll all want autographs from Tim and that sort of thing. Shower him with flowers. Do that out in the lobby if you don't mind. I appreciate that. And then just finally, don't miss out on the draw. Any students in the audience, if you have not yet got your name in for some very exciting and valuable prizes, please do make sure you do that. I believe there's some um, draws for gift certificates to the bookstore and for tuition, really nice valuable prizes. The winner of the, those prizes will be announced later by email. Now it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker today, President and Vice Chancellor of Concordia University of Edmonton, Dr. Tim Lorman. I'm sure Tim's reception here will be a little bit better than that recently enjoyed at the UN by another president. Um, and I know for a fact Tim has better hair, so he's, he's good, he's good. <laughs> Dr. Lorman has been with Q for many years, since 2003, most notably in the role of professor in our Faculty of Education. He was raised and educated in Australia, sorry, Australia, uh, in case you couldn't tell from his accent, with a PhD from Monash University. He's taught in classroom situations in Australia, in Canada, and has active research interests in inclusive education and pedagogy. Dr. Lorman, or Tim, I think to most of us here, pretty much everyone, uh, has worked, conducted research, and presented at major conferences around the world. In 2010, he was Senior Visiting Research Fellow at the University of Bologna in Italy, and in 2013, Visiting Research Professor at Queen's University Belfast, Northern Ireland, a very international profile. Tim is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Educational Psychology at a large university across the river who shall remain nameless. He's held a number of major Canadian research grants and recently completed a large cross-institutional and cross-national CETA project aimed at reform of the education system in Ukraine in order better to support inclusive education. His current international work is with school systems in Pacific Island nations, although I'm not sure where he's actually finding time to do that these days with his current role. His publications, including some very exceptional books and journal editorships, are too extensive to list here. Tim also does podcasts, if you don't know. Check him out on iTunes. Tim's quite, quite involved in a number of different things. In 2015, Inclusion Alberta awarded him the Community Inclusion Award, and in 2016, he was presented with Concordia's own President's Research Award. And yes, in case you're wondering, that was before he himself became president. <laughs> Just wanted to be clear, because if you're thinking Donald Trump, you couldn't twist anything past him. So now, without further ado, I give you the President and Vice, Pre uh, Vice Chancellor of Concordia University of Edmonton, Dr. Tim Lorman. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, thank you, Valerie, for that uh, very warm welcome. And uh, hopefully you will be laughing with me and not at me. 
um, this afternoon, although, you know, it's not exactly a funny topic, the state of the university, so I'll keep the uh, comedy routine down to a, a bare minimum here. Um, but thank you for coming. This is our second uh, State of the University Address, and it's um, a piece that I, I intend to continue on in future years. I think it's a good forum for some kind of formal uh, reporting to uh, the Concordia community and the community uh, in general, uh, as well as letting you know uh, the directions that we're taking as we, we move forward. So, as I did last year, I need to acknowledge the work of our Vice Presidents, our Registrar and uh, the others who contributed various sections of this address to me in draft form, and I've used those either in whole or in part. Uh, so these people include our VPA and Provost, Dr Valerie Hennetuk, who you just heard from. Uh, they include our Registrar, Dr Andreas Gulzo. Is Andreas here? Not here. He's here in the speech. Um, our VP Student Life and Learning, Dr. Barb Van Ingen. Thank you, Barb. Uh, our VP External Affairs and International Relations, Dr. Manfred Zoik. Thank you, Manfred. Uh, our VP Finance and Operations, Ms. Deborah Rodrigo. Deb. Uh, and our institutional researcher, Dr. Celia Bukutu. Ce Cecilia, are you here? Yes? Oh, yeah, there you are. I can't see people because the lights are kind of like in my face here. Uh, Judy Cruzy. Mrs. Judy Cruzy, who is our board secretary, university secretary, who's somewhere uh, hovering up the back there. Uh, Lana Kuzik. Lana, thank you very much for your role in organising this. She might be outside still. Oh, no, she's there. And Cassidy Schrogan. So, Cassidy, thank you very much. Cassidy actually is quite nervous about this event because she's driving the slide. So, if this is terrible, it's all her fault. Uh, and I'd also like to thank those who provided some very constructive and useful feedback on last year's event, and I think it's improved this year's um, uh, State of the University uh, address. Um, and I'd like to now acknowledge the members of the Board of Governors uh, uh, who are here um, today. We have our Board Chair, still Board Chair, Mr Mike Wade. Uh, and we have uh, Al Lyons, who I saw walk in, he's somewhere. Um, John Atchison. John, Andrew Price, Rizwan Kanji, Jonathan Strand, and a person who's not on our board, but he is a, um, an increasing, uh, increasingly familiar face at Concordia, Jim Gendron, who's come in here from the community to um, offer his support today. So thank you for coming. Now, I spent most of last year telling everyone that uh, Concordia should try and become Canada's preeminent small university. And you asked me what that means, and I demurred because I said that's a community decision. Well, I think that over the past year, we have come to some conclusions uh, on that matter, and these conclusions are reflected in our new academic plan that I'll speak to later on. And there are, however, some metrics that are already pointing to our success. Student enrolment numbers are up, in fact, they are way up this year, and the satisfaction of our graduates is similarly, similarly on a steep upward trajectory. A new building is finished, and we're looking forward to the next one, aren't we, Deb? <laughs> we're experiencing pressures related to strong growth, uh, but this is a really good problem to have. Uh, Concordia is in a really, really strong position, probably stronger than we've ever been. Now let me begin with some information on student satisfaction. And we always do very well on the Canadian University Survey Consortium, or the CUSC, annual national survey. But we don't tend to compare our results to those of the past. Well, this year we did that. So the CUSC survey uh, looks at students in different years of their program, and it does so on a rotating basis. So it'll look at first year students one year, uh, second, third year students another year, and then graduating students another year. So it's a three year rotating basis. The 2018 survey was of graduating students, so students who were, who, who were leaving us. And this was done most recently in 2015 before that. So we compared our results for this year uh, and 2015 against the Canadian average. Now, as you can see in this slide, uh, we've seen a 16% increase who say that Concordia exceeded their expectations. Uh, we now have 44% of graduating students saying that, compared to 22% nationally, so double. Uh, we've also have a small and shrinking percentage of students who say that we fell short of their expectations. This is something our whole community can be proud of. Faculty, staff, our students, 
can be proud of this. This slide shows very high levels of satisfaction overall with education at Concordia. Our graduating students who reported being very satisfied increased by 15% since 2015, and they are now at 43%. And this is compared to a national average of 20%. So importantly, no student said that they were very dissatisfied, only mildly disgruntled. No, no one very dissatisfied. This slide shows a 6% increase in students who are satisfied with their decision to attend Concordia over our 2015 numbers, uh, which were already high, and we are now reflecting an 18%, um, uh, we're, we're now 18% higher in that area than the national average. And the final slide that I'm going to share from the CUSC is about student belonging. Now, up to 88% of our students strongly agree or agree that they feel that they belong at Concordia. And this is a marked improvement over our 2015 figures and the national average. So we can and we should be proud of these results. They are stunning. I don't think any other university in Canada is producing results like this. Uh, they're a testament to the hard work of our entire community, our faculty, our staff, our administration, our board and our supporters. So let us also not forget the contributions that our students make to this environment. Student groups such as the CSA and the GSA have done much to support an outstanding student experience that we offer here at Concordia. I'll move on now to our Board of Governors. Our board continues to function very well and it represents a diverse range of viewpoints and diverse areas of expertise in its deliberations. Now, Mr Mike Wade has chaired his last meeting and that was back in August. His term as a board member and therefore also as a chair, is over and he must step down. And Mike provided solid leadership and service at a critical time in our development. He led the board through both the break with the Lutheran Church and the search for an onboarding of a new president. He has helped the board become more accountable more and more professional in its work and his focus has always been on what is best for Concordia. So thank you, Mike. We all very much appreciate your service to our university. The good news is that we have an experienced board member in Mr Russ Morrow who is succeeding Mike as chair. And while we love Mike, we are all looking forward to working with Russ. I've come to know Russ as highly intelligent and knowledgeable, he's sensible, he's reliable and he's a thoroughly decent and likeable person. He will offer our board the sort of leadership it needs as we move our institution ever forward. His first board meeting as chair will be in November and I know that uh, we will work very well together. The main issue facing the board in the current year, in the coming year, continues to be resolving what some are calling the public-private issue. Now, I actually said this last year, so this is like we're, we're in a time warp here. Uh, a full 12 months later, the issue is still not resolved. Uh, Concordia is uh, currently still in the academic, independent academic institution sector. Uh, but with the authority of the board, I've been working with the government of Alberta to explore what a change in status might look like. We're getting closer to a resolution. The government of Alberta has been doing its due diligence in, in looking into Concordia status in various areas. And the board has engaged in conversations with representatives of the government of Alberta and the other Edmonton post-secondary presidents. Both the government and the board need to agree that being public is a good idea before that can happen. Uh, and a decision is likely imminent, um, and it's not entirely clear what that decision would be at this point. We'll move on to academics. Now, Concordia's new academic plan has been drafted and revised and is now winding its way through the appropriate bodies. Uh, it has been passed, I believe, by the uh, Academic Standards Council and is on its way to our General Faculties Council. So this document, just like Concordia, is like no other academic plan you've seen. And it's intentionally that way. It's been years in the making, really, and it's been firmly rooted in our evolution from a faith-based institution to a more inclusive institution. Our current negotiations around being a public institution, possibly. The shift from academic programs governed by the Concordia core to a more appropriate array of institutional learning outcomes my own vision as president since 2017, and the master story developed over the course of this past year. Based on such wide consultation, excuse me, 
bit emotional when I talk about academic plans. <laughs> Based on such wide consultation, Dr. Henderson and her team have crafted a dynamic, inspiring plan that I believe speaks to us all, faculty, staff, students, as well as alumni, parents and community partners. This will securely guide Concordia University of Edmonton through the next five years. Our Indigenous Knowledge and Research Centre has just opened with, a brand new centre for, with our brand new Centre for Science, Research and Innovation. If you haven't been in the building yet, just go in there and have a look. Both promise expanded opportunities for students and faculty to grow and develop. We have state-of-the-art science labs in there. They're not yet kitted out with appropriate glassware and chemicals and other things that science labs need, but that is coming soon. Uh, we have a psychology clinic which will be inhabited for the first year by Catholic Social Services. Uh, we have a home for our Centre for Chinese Studies, uh, which has already had uh, an event, the, uh, the Moon, uh, New Moon, New Year. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, our Centre for Innovation and Applied Research is in there. And all of these facilities will enhance teaching and research on campus as we move towards our 100th anniversary. I don't know, everyone will especially appreciate the design thinking space, which has been furnished with an eye to creating a flexible, multifunctional room. The plaza immediately to the east of the Centre for Science, Research and Innovation includes a medicine garden and flagpoles, and it refocuses our attention on, our fr uh, our attention on the front lawn, which is located so invitingly near the river valley. It also has a nice uh, ceremonial sacred fire bowl there that uh, exploded a couple of times on the weekend just to give us a little bit of action there. It didn't like fire apparently which is an odd thing for a fire bowl. This has been a tremendously exciting year for us also in terms of new programs. Our new Masters of Education in Educational Leadership was approved uh, and welcomed its first cohort of eight students in July. Following an extensive development and review process we're now working closely with the Campus Alberta Quality Council towards final approval of our first doctoral level degree. This applied doctorate in psychology will reshape the landscape at Concordia in terms of both marking a real achievement and setting a challenge for us all. We hope to launch the PsyD in January or September 2020. We're really at the mercy of the approval process here. But doing so depends on some final work that we need to do internally uh, as well as the pace of, of that approval. Uh, and this is external, more or less out of our control. Our Bachelor of Science in IT is now under review as well, and if approved, it will not only provide a greatly in-demand program for our undergraduates, but also it'll serve as a vital domestic feeder for programs such as our MISM and MISAM uh, programs. Of note is the fact that these programs have recently benefited from additional funding under Bill 2. So thank you to the uh, Government of Alberta for that. Finally, work continues on our Certificate in Occupational Health and Safety, which will, gain, which will again fill a much needed niche, drawing on some strong partnerships that Concordia has with industry. We're also exploring the development of a new access program. It's hit a couple of bumps in the road, but we're still looking at it. This is intended to support marginalised and underserved uh, populations, including Indigenous students, including newcomers to Canada, single parents, mature students, uh, those with special challenges. Um, and this would help to ensure their, their success in post-secondary education. Our high quality academic offerings coupled with our warm and friendly environment due in part to our deliberately small scale, make us a natural choice for first-generation university students, I believe. Our Fine Arts Department has had an exceptional year, and I see some representatives from that department here. Uh, in terms of public performances, performances during the 2017-18 season, we had uh, one of our students, Isabella Ramos, she blew us away with two performances of handbells. Uh, these were at the induction of our Chancellor Stephen Mandel and at a dinner honouring our Chancellor Emeritus uh, at Judge um, Alan Wakowicz. Uh, October's Sacred Music Festival at Windspear was outstanding, as were other performances this year by Festival City Winds, by our community ensemble, our choirs, Jubiloso, Bella Voce, and of course, our outstanding Concordia Symphony Orchestra, which is amazing, actually. The Canadian premiere of the play Waxworks 
was notable in most every way. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I sat in the front row. Uh, as was the Dada play later in the season. Now, these performances and others I've not mentioned here place us at the cutting edge of the Edmonton arts community. We've also uh, been the home for quite a while now of the Canadian Centre for Scholarship and the Christian Faith, and this has been since 2012. Uh, this centre is an international powerhouse in interdisciplinary research and publication, including its own Canadian Journal for Scholarship and the Christian Faith, and three books coming out of its annual conferences. Uh, this centre represents Concordia's commitment and respect for our rich heritage while moving forward with future initiatives such as the 2019 Conference on Technology and Theology. This conference is slated uh, for Friday, Saturday, the 3rd and 4th of May 2019 here at Concordia uh, and will be in collaboration with our new research cluster on machine learning and artificial intelligence. And thank you to Bill Anderson uh, who I saw here, there he is, for his leadership of, that, of the centre. So thank you, Bill. I'll now turn to our enrolment picture. It's really interesting. Over the past few years, Concordia University of Edmonton's overall enrolment has seen a steady increase as shown in this graph. LERS numbers, we call them LERS numbers, they're the numbers that we report to the province um, are reported here. They do not include enrolment in our certificate and diploma programs, so there are additional students in those programs, but only approved degree programs. Uh, the, this 2018-19 value is um, the, our registrar's prediction based on the current tracking of our registration. Uh, so we will have a, we have what's called a census day, which is, I can't remember when, it's coming up soon. That's the day that the, the numbers will be finalised here. Next, we'll look at the details of our various programs. The following chart shows enrolment for our LERS reported graduate programs. Uh, for the reporting year 2018-19, we are also now uh, offering an MED program in educational leadership. And this will contribute a few FLE to our graduate enrolment. But as you can see, it's decreased. We're trying to get at the reasons behind that and we are taking active steps to remedy that uh, issue that we have in our graduate programs. Both of our after-degree programs, the B.Ed. and the Bachelor of Environmental Health, saw a re relatively steady enrolment. Uh, for the 2018-19 year, the B.Ed. Uh, has switched up to three cohorts, not two cohorts, but now it has three cohorts of 30 students uh, instead of two cohorts of 35 to, to 40. So this will uh, significantly increase our after-degree enrolment. In our first degree undergraduate programs, and these include open studies, uh, these have been primarily responsible for the increase in enrolment over the last five years. So uh, we are now expecting another large increase in undergraduate enrolment for 2018-19, uh, but it is notable that the increases are not distributed across all, all programs. We see um, uh, increases mainly in psychology, uh, in the arts, and also in our science program, uh, which seems to be ever, ever more popular. But um, this is, when you just look at the difference between 2013-14 and now, it's quite amazing. I now turn to our financial picture, and I'm going to start from a kind of high level. People are always interested in our finances. During, the 20, during 2017, the Alberta economy strengthened. Uh, we had real GB, a real GDP of 4.9%, and our growth is, despite oil issues, is the fastest in the country. It's broad-based, with nearly every sector of the economy expanding. The economic forecast is calling for a 2.9% uh, growth in GDP uh, this coming year. There are, however, still some Albertans without jobs and facing financial hardship as a result of the downturn. And for those individuals, it continues to be a tough time, despite the very positive data. There continues to be pipeline uncertainty. Uh, oil is trending at, is it about $80 a barrel, somewhere around there at the moment? Uh, and Alberta is expected to have an $8.8 .8 billion deficit this year. Uh, that's down uh, $1.7 billion from March uh, 2017. Now I'll talk more specifically to Concordia's financial results and I'll give you the, the more provincial picture to sort of context contextualise where we're at here. Uh, Concordia finished the year ending, uh, our year end, financial year end is March 31st. Uh, so, as of March 31st, 2018, we had an operating surplus of $1.7 million. 
and this represented a 3.4% increase over the prior year's normalised net operating surplus. Now, you may think that's terrible, running a surplus when we need things at Concordia and we need faculty and we need people, but the reality is that we must run an annual surplus to ensure our ongoing financial health and to fund future growth. It's not really a surplus, so to speak. It's not extra money that we can dip into for um, cheesies at parties and things like that. <laughs> um, because we are an independent academic institution, we need to remember that we do not receive funds for any capital projects from the Government of Alberta. The directive of our Board of Governors is that surplus operating funds should be applied to capital projects. Our new Centre for Science, Research and Innovation is one example of that. Uh, so, uh, we had excess, capital, uh, excess funds applied to that capital project. During the 2017-18 year, our revenue grew by 1.5%, or half a million dollars. The university had a 4.4% increase in tuition revenue, and this was solely from increased enrolment because we froze our tuition last year. In fact, we have frozen our tuition for multiple years. Um, government operational funding was frozen for the year also, uh, for this year, and it represents 40% of our revenue. Tuition and government operating funding combined represented 90.2% of our revenue, and with such a heavy dependence on just two revenue streams, the university will continue to find new revenue streams. We have to, uh, particularly in the area of research grants and fundraising. So it's the old metaphor of a, of a stool with three legs. We actually only really have two. Those legs are government funding and student tuition. We really need to build that third leg. Um, to ensure that we're stable, stably financially. Total expenses for the year ending March 31, 2018 grew by 5.3%. So they grew $1.5 million to $30.4 million from the previous year. Our salary and benefits accounts for 71% of all operating expenses. The $1.8 million increase in salaries and wages was driven by increases in staffing and increases in compensation. A total of five full-time faculty and instructional positions and 16.5 support staff positions were added during the 2017-18 financial year. Capital expenditures in fiscal 2018 totaled uh, just over $12 million. This is a significant increase over fis the fiscal 2017 capital spend, and it's because of the build of our new uh, Centre for Science, Research and Innovation. The total capital expenditure from this building was budgeted to be $16.3 million. That's what the building costs us. Uh, we are on budget, if not on time. Um, we have $6.7 million coming from a strategic infrastructure grant, which is a federal government grant, and the rest, fundraising, operations, a loan from the Bank of Montreal. Our first quarter of fiscal 2019, Concordia had a deficit of $235,000. Gasp. This is 21.4% greater than we budgeted, but here's the good news. It is significantly better than the deficit we had compared to this time last year. <laughs> that was 761,000. So we're good. Enrolment for the fall and winter is looking good and at this juncture we're just going to continue with the current budget plan. It will be fine. Uh, although fiscal restraint, of course, is always strongly encouraged. We like fiscal restraint, don't we? I'll now turn to student life and learning. Concordia's student life and learning team supports students from orientation through to graduation and beyond as alumni. Now, at the time of my State of the University, university address last year, our Student Success Centre was under construction, uh, and it was set to open that November. Uh, it did, it officially opened on November 20 of last year, and it has centralised Concordia's excellent student services. And students go in there and study. They really like that space. It's an, basically an Apple store for student services. We understand that every student has different expectations of university, they have different learning styles, they have different needs, and our one-stop, multimodal, personalised learning and life supports improves the con consist consistency of service and student experience. And it's life supports, not life support. If you're on life support, <laughs> greater issues. 
This is all in one location, so students can find uh, assistance if they have academic challenges, if they have difficulties with their living accommodations, uh, they can develop skills, they can set goals and prepare for life after university, whether that's a career or grad school or something else. I'll talk a little bit about athletics, one of my favourite topics. The 2017-18 athletic season was another ban banner year for the Thunder. Uh, the women's soccer, the men's basketball, the women's basketball, cross country and badminton teams were all ranked in the top 15 nationally at various points in their seasons. For a small place, that is amazing, in the top 15 nationally. While members of our golf, badminton and curling teams all qualified for national championships in their sports, across the ACAC and CCAA, 11 of 12 Thunder teams qualified for conference championships or playoffs and achieved the following results. 11 out of 12. Cassidy Turcott won a silver medal at the ACAC Women's Golf Championship and she finished 15th at Nationals. The women's soccer team settled for their second straight ACAC bronze medal. They just missed out on a qualifying national championships berth. The men's basketball team finished with an ACAC bronze. Uh, Coach Reagan Wood was awarded the ACAC Men's Basketball Coach of the Year and was a finalist for the National Coast Coach of the Year Award. The men's curling team, who they tell me just a few years ago were thought of, thought of themselves as a joke, well, they won the ACAC championship and just lost out on a tiebreaker to miss the podium at nationals. Uh, they finished in fifth place in Canada. Uh, apparently a few years ago that was just, who wants to play, who wants to do curling? And people who'd never curled before signed up and now they're in nationals coming fifth in the country. The badminton team finished second at the ACAC Championships and Takesha Wang, women's signals, singles, not signals, singles, and Desmond Wang, men's sing singles, uh, won their respective events. Um, and this carried on to the first ever uh, CCAA National Championships that we hosted right here in our gym. The Wang siblings both won gold, national gold at that event. So proud of them. The Thunder had 23 ACAC All-Conference Award recipients, one CCAA All-Canadian, the CCAA Badminton Player of the Year, that was Takesha, and the ACAC, Ash Ath ACAC Athlete of the Year, which was also Takesha Wang. So the year ended on an exciting note uh, because uh, our Athletics Director, Joel Mrak, won the ACAC Athletics Director of the Year Award and was a finalist for the CCAA Athletics Director of the Year Award. Uh, I don't know, our trophy shelf must be overflowing, I think. It's, it's quite incredible. If you haven't been out, and I know most, many of you haven't, if you have not been out to, to some form of Concordia Sports, just go. You will love it. You might think, hey, I'm not going to enjoy it, I don't like sports. doesn't matter. They are great events. They are fantastic. You should go. Uh, we are also going to be hosting the 2019 National Women's Soccer Championships here at Concordia. That's fantastic. They're being held in November. <laughs> so let's cross our fingers and hope for a warm fall. The Concordia Commitment. Now, Concordia is, Can is Canada's preeminent small university because we do things that make us unique. And the Concordia Commitment is a new program that we are introducing this year, and it is the only one of its kind in Alberta. So we base this on a successful program at the University of Regina, uh, and the Concordia Commitment supports students through their university experience and beyond, through to successful employment or graduate study. There are five elements to it. The first one is connecting. So if a student signs up for the Concordia Commitment, they are connected with an advisor. That advisor can be a faculty member, it could be an administrator, it could be a staff member, it could be the president or a, or a vice president. Um, that advisor will give them guidance throughout their entire program. So what we hope is a sustained, nice, long relationship with that student. Uh, the second piece is learning, so it'll help students adjust to life at university uh, and the demands and it'll offer them various workshops to enhance their skills, their study skills, their life management skills, all those sorts of things that go towards making a successful, successful student. 
Uh, it has an engage component to it, uh, where students need to become involved in campus life. They need to meet people, make friends, they'll develop new skills and they will become campus leaders. There is an explore element where students will attend a range of academic seminars and presentations and they'll be connecting with the intellectual life of Concordia in a broader sense than through only their program. And then finally, they'll be starting their careers. So the program will assist students uh, through a path of self-discovery to work out what they want to do build a career plan and build the skills to actually be successful after university. So here is the commitment that we make to those students. If they complete all requirements of that program and they have a 2.3 GPA at graduation, they are eligible for one year of free courses at Concordia if they don't find suitable employment or they don't make it into the grad studies that they wanted to make it into. Uh, so it's our way of saying if, if uh, you do not move on to what you want to do after school, you can come back here and re-equip yourself with some more tools to help you uh, move out later on. Based on the experience at University of Regina, it's unlikely we'll see too many students coming back because in going through the Concordia Commitment Program, they are well equipped to meet the objectives that they want to meet when they leave. In September of 2017, Oh, uh, I should do a little plug here too. There is a, a, a Concordia Commitment Lecture, an annual lecture from, uh, it will be in future years someone prominent. Uh, this year they're getting me. Um, that is next week, October the 3rd, if I'm, uh, if I'm correct, October the 3rd, here at noon. And the topic I'm speaking about is why do we exclude? Uh, so, come if you would like to. It's not just for those students, it's for any students or anyone who is interested. In September of 2017, we launched our mental health strategy. And this was a bold commitment to mental health and wellness at Concordia. Now, our mental health strategy contained three priorities for 2017-18. These were the creation of a peer support team, which we have done, check. A movies for mental health event, check. And a mental health first aid training um, series for all faculty and staff who are interested. Uh, so we have not a, we're a small institution, we don't have a gigantic faculty and staff uh, complement, but 79 people went through that first, that mental health first aid training. And it's a two day session, right? So it's a significant um, piece of training and we are really well equipped now to, to help people who are experiencing difficulties moving into the future. I'm so proud of that. Uh, we'll, con we'll continue with these three initiatives, of course, uh, throughout this next year, but we're also adding some new priorities that will strengthen uh, our mental health efforts. So we're going to have some targeted mental health supports for Indigenous students. We're going to provide programming to students, faculty and staff, to try to build some personal resilience uh, and wellness, whatever wellness is. Um, did you know that Weight Watchers took weight out of their name? They're now WW because they're focusing on wellness. People don't go to Weight Watchers because they want to be well. They want to lose weight. We're going to enhance support during critical transition times for all members of the campus community. And we're going to promote web-based self-screening programs for students, faculty and staff. Now, these initiatives are all funded through the Sean O'Brien Mental Health Fund, which you can contribute to if you would like, and some of you do already. Um, and also the annual President's uh, Fundraiser for Mental Health. It's a breakfast that we have uh, and we raise funds through there. And we also have some uh, Government of Alberta targeted funds, $90,000, that goes towards supporting these programs. I'll talk a little bit about our Indigenous strategy. You may have noticed our Indigenous Knowledge and Research Centre is vibrant. Go in there. If you haven't got in there yet, go in there. You'll love it. Concordia is committed to reconciliation that involves recognising how colonising structures and relationships impact Indigenous students. Concordia's Indigenous strategy builds upon initiatives and programs of education, research, outreach and engagement with an Indigenous focus. We've been making efforts to build and deepen relationships with Indigenous communities through visits to First Nations communi communities such as Cold Lake First Nations and collaboration with Métis Nation of Alberta and the Rupert's Land Institute. The goals and initiatives related to our Indigenous strategy are guided by our Elders Council 
and they're done in collaboration with the Indigenous Students Council and Indigenous communities throughout Alberta. We're really pleased uh, to be partnering with the Métis Nation of Alberta, for example. Uh, and on September 7th, we signed a declaration uh, of the uh, $500,000 endowment that we now have to support Métis student scholarships here at Concordia. It was a very generous contribution. It was a matching contribution of them, $250,000 from them and $250,000 from us. Another exciting advancement of the Indigenous strategy was the hiring of a manager for the Indigenous Knowledge and Research Centre, as this role is central to the advancement of priority initiatives. Danielle Powder will assist... Is Danielle here? Danielle's assisting students right now. That's why she's not here. She will assist Concordia with the recruitment and retention of self-identified Indigenous students. So Danielle will create and she'll implement a five-year plan for the Indigenous Knowledge and Research Centre with special emphasis on working with the elders to provide traditional programming for the campus community in general and our Indigenous, our indigenous students in particular. Now, as tradition dictates, Concordia made the commitment to host a round dance for four consecutive years. Our first was held in October 2017, and this evening was started with a sacred pipe ceremony, followed by a feast, and the round dance uh, uh, attracted approximately 250 to 300 people at that time, and it was here in Tegla. Uh, it was an extraordinary event. We recently ho hosted our second round dance, and I think we attracted between four and 600 people. It's hard to tell because we couldn't count, but we had it in the gymnasium because Tegla was too small. Um, it was a tremendous success. It was an amazing event. Uh, that was just this past weekend. Uh, our round dance inspires joy and happiness. It's a display of kinship and harmony with our Indigenous brothers and sisters. It's not just for Indigenous people. There was everyone there. Um, it was terrific. Come next year, if you didn't go this year. It'll be about the same time. They have them, we have them in the fall. Now, seven years into our internationalisation program, we now focus on strategic areas of places, people, ideas and resources and global awareness. Now, since in 2017 when we defined uh, our main areas of focus, which are Brazil, China and Western Europe, we've been deepening and intensifying internationalisation with partners in these regions. We've expanded agreements with European Erasmus Plus or Mobile Plus programs by invitation from partners in Spain, Germany, Portugal, Poland and most recently Greece. Uh, the programs allowed all constituents of Concordia to have meaningful experiences in those countries, all funded by the European Union. Thank you, European Union, if you're watching on the live stream. Um, <laughs> is that why they're going broke? I don't know. Uh, students, staff and faculty have been, spent time uh, with our partners in these countries. Concordia has hosted an increased number of faculty and staff also from these European partners, which always enriches our research and our uh, teaching and our, uh, even our administration and other practices. So over the past year, we've reviewed all of our international agreements and we've terminated 10 of them because they were inactive. So we're not going to waste our time on agreements that aren't going anywhere. We've also signed some strategic new agreements in Macedonia, in Norway, in Brazil and in the Punjab in India. Uh, and this is our first significant outre outreach to the Indian university uh, community. Over the past year, Concordia students have been out studying abroad to Denmark, to Australia, to Barbados, Spain, Brazil and the UK. And for the first time in Concordia's history, we've also started cooperation uh, and have signed two dual degree agreements. In France, we have a three uh, uh, to four year dual degree in arts. So, this is, um, so they get a degree in French from Concordia as well as a, uh, a degree uh, which, and, it, and it's the French, it's in French, so I'm not going to try to butcher it with my pronunciation, but a similar degree from the university in France. Uh, in China, we have four year dual degree in management. Uh, in both pro so they will get a degree from Concordia Management and from our Chinese partner in management. And both programs have started this September. Our spring and summer programs are expanding. More cohorts are embarking on special programs or faculty led 
uh, study abroad missions, uh, with two of these planned for 2019 in Brazil and Spain. Uh, summer programs at Concordia are in education, English and public health, and these are for Chinese and Japanese students, and they continue to grow. It's really nice in the summer to have a populated campus of, uh, instead of uh, um, uh, a barren wasteland of tumbleweeds. Um, a new special English program is being planned for a cohort coming from Brazil, and this will have an, an emphasis on medicine, even though we don't have a faculty of medicine. Um, there are two centres that we have housed. Uh, in our new Centre for Science Research and Innovation building to support their growth and development. As I mentioned previously, these are our Centre for Chinese Studies uh, and our Centre for Chinese Teacher Development, uh, which is now two years old, and it is under the, the leadership of our dynamic director, Dr. Xinxin Fang, uh, and it's thriving and it's growing. Our Centre for Innovation and Applied Research is now also two years old uh, and is also growing. Um, and our, we'll be heading to Brazil at some point in the near future um, to find paths for international business acceleration and industry connections. I'll talk a little bit about our alumni. Um, with our new structure uh, in, uh, of external affairs and international relations, Concordia is continue, continuing to work uh, with further developing our alumni relations and by gathering information on all alumni we're trying to reach out to them individually via mailing and media outlets that will be created uh, by Christmas this year. We have a strong and enthusiastic uh, alumni executive team. They're a terrific group. Uh, we have a, a new position, which is a director of alumni relations uh, and clerical support, in, and that all helps to foster school spirit and pride amongst our alum. Uh, now, many are forgotten, several are disgruntled, but many are active and proud of Concordia. And we want to strengthen where we have weaknesses and build on where we have strengths. Uh, and we'll work on that this year. For example, I'm going to be starting to host alumni receptions uh, where appropriate when I travel. So I have to go to a University's Canada meeting at Ottawa next month and I'll be hosting. We have 40 alum that we know of in Ottawa uh, and I'm going to be hosting a, a reception for them. So when I travel, uh, I'm going to be doing that in China as well when I go to China later on. Research. So the research culture at Concordia continues to evolve and has some strong developments over the past year. Uh, increased numbers of applications to funding agencies mean that in 2017, the faculty received around $100,000 in external grant funding. Tolly Bradford received a Shirk Insight Development Grant that examines uh, the historical role of the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, we also received an NSERC Connect Grant, and that was Fimi Jafar, and that facilitated collaboration between Concordia and a Montreal-based industry partner to investigate cyber system responses during disaster recovery. Internally, Concordia continues to support research by faculty and students uh, in terms of both new projects and dissemination with a limited budget, within a limited budget envelope. Major faculty projects funded this past year include uh, one by Katie Collins, who looked at the effects uh, of exposure to biased language, uh, and she examines how news articles describe criminal behaviour uh, differently based on group, the group membership of alleged perpetrators. Uh, Xin Chen, examined neurotoxic metal, metal manganese metals in peatland soil, and that was following the uh, forest fires up in Fort McMurray. Uh, in December, 11 faculty were awarded the full allocation of 108 uh, credit hours of teaching release for research purposes. In October, we held our inaugural author celebration. We had 23 Concordia authors and artists participating in this acknowledgement of books and other significant publications. Uh, in April, we held our third annual research forum poster exhibition with participation from 67 faculty and students. They displayed posters that demonstrated the depth and breadth of the innovative research being done at Concordia across all disciplines. Abstracts are compiled in a booklet and posted on our website and will soon be included in our open access repository. A new interdisciplinary research cluster on machine learning and artificial intelligence was launched in September. And this is being led by uh, Ed Boras and, and it includes many international uh, collaborations. And finally in February, the Gerald S. Crispin Research Award was uh, awarded to Dr. Tim LeBron in uh, uh, our Philosophy and Religious Studies Department. I'll talk about the risks that we face now. We do face a number of risks in this next year and some of them continue on from last year. And the main risks as I see them fall into two categories. 
These are financial risks and growth risks, and the two are very much interrelated. Now, I've just spent the past 35 minutes or so, or however long it's been, telling you about how great things are at Concordia, and they are. That is undeniable. Our student numbers are increasing, and they're at record levels, and this is what we want, and it's extremely healthy, and it's extremely helpful to us as an institution. But such rapid growth also brings challenges. Despite, and indeed to, agree, to a degree because of this growth, our finances remain tight and budgeting remains challenging. We've found many savings and efficiencies over the past year and have found some ways to enhance our revenues. But even having done that, our budget is only just coming close to balancing. It's not due to mismanagement, it's due to growth pressures. More students is a good thing, but more students require more instructors. They require more service from staff, they require more space in which to learn. They need access to information technology. We need to keep them safe. They flush toilets. They open doors and let heat out. And we need to clean the floors more often. All of this, of course, costs money. And with respect to some of the issues, short-term fixes are difficult. Student numbers can be volatile. They can go down. And so we need to be really careful with respect to the long-term commitments, financial commitments that we make. As we move into our 2019-20 budget cycle, we're cognizant of the risks that this poses to the quality of the education we provide. We know we need more full-time faculty members to support key areas of the institution in which, in which this growth is occurring. We'll be working with our deans to try to address this need in a sensible, in a measured and in a sustainable way. However, hiring new faculty members only occurs quickly if you want to hire bad ones. Hiring good faculty members takes time and they need to be properly budgeted for and properly vetted through the hiring process. We'll settle for nothing less than excellence in our instructors here at Concordia. Thinking more long term, we need at least two more buildings. One of these is a new student residence. The second will be a new academic building. If we continue to grow at our current rate, or even half of our current rate, we'll run out of classroom space very quickly not to mention public areas for students to study and socialise in. So these new buildings are important, but like new faculty members, they don't happen overnight. So sure, constructing a new building obviously takes time, but finding the money to pay for that construction is very difficult and indeed places us in a bind. We do not get money from the government of Alberta for new buildings. Where will the money come from? We need to be very careful with our levels of debt. We must resolve this issue and the matter becomes ever more urgent each year as we grow. Now, as I mentioned last year, an additional financial pressure is our recently completed Centre for Science Research and Innovation. It's a wonderful thing, but it is a financial pressure. Being an independent institution meant, meant that we received no provincial money towards its completion. And so we've been trying to find the $9.6 million um, that we need to fully fund it. But in this economy, fundraising is not easy. And further, as I noted last year, uh, building this is, uh, building the CSRI is only part of the expenses we, we face. There are many additional ex expenses associated with staffing and running the building. So here are some for areas of focus and opportunity for 2018-19. And I'm excited about the many areas of opportunity that we face in the current year and beyond. Uh, we have all the building blocks to be Canada's preeminent small university. In fact, I might just say we already are, because looking at those student satisfaction uh, results I led with, uh, I don't think any other university is achieving that. So maybe we are already. Maybe I'll just declare it here and that's what it is. Uh, as you can see from my address today, our students are highly satisfied. We're in a good financial position. Uh, we're well governed, we're well managed, uh, and we have exciting and important academic programs. Our athletics, music and drama and other areas are flourishing. Students are making us their first choice, but we should not become complacent. We can still improve. I'd like, for example, to see us make one or two of our various centres or research clusters world-class and world-renowned. Now, this might mean bringing in superstar faculty members, if we can attract them, or it might mean further developing the superstars we already have here at Concordia. I think we can make Canada sit up and pay attention if we develop strong, undeniable centres of expertise and excellence and then get the word out. 
This happens by having the right people in the right positions. So let's try to look for those opportunities over the next year. And as I noted earlier and last year, what's become known as the public-private issue does need to be resolved. It's a great opportunity for us either way. The decision we make will impact the next 100 years of our history. If we decide to stay independent, then we'll rush full steam ahead into a vibrant, independent future. If the decision is to become public, then we will happily make the adjustments necessary to take full advantage of what being public might offer us. The decision, however, is not black and white. There are advantages and challenges apparent no matter what is decided. It all rests on negotiations between our board and the government of Alberta. And I will say we have a highly competent board now at Concordia and the right decision will be made uh, in, in this area, as in other areas. Potential opportunities for us at Northlands also continue to be a possibility. I've devoted a significant time and effort to discussions with the City of Edmonton over the past year, <laughs> as has Jim, uh, and they are going very well. Uh, the opportunities for Concordia now appear to be more concrete than they were a year ago, uh, but this is a very long-term project and uh, we are in it for the long haul. Concordia has never been in better shape than we are right now at this moment. Now, this success is down to every one of us. It's down to our faculty, our staff, our administration, our board, our students and our community supporters. The trick is to sustain this success and to push ourselves even forward to continue to improve, to make our great institution even better. You know, there's that book from good to great. We're going from great to greater, more greater. -er. We're going to go from great to preeminent. Every day I'm grateful to be president of this fine institution, a place that is academically rigorous, but that also treats students with compassion and kindness, a place that values scholarship and research and that wants to serve Edmonton and beyond. We're a community, a place where you can sit at the back but where someone will always invite you to the front. Thank you for coming this afternoon and for your support of Concordia. And finally, this entire address can be found, as of now, I believe, on our homepage and the main website. Uh, and of course, the, there's the streaming, which will be uh, available at any time, I believe. It's not just live. Um, I'm happy to uh, take questions, but thank you very much for your engagement and patience throughout this second annual State of the University address. Yeah, I think I am now. Thank you very much, Tim, for a robust, thought-provoking, and very well-balanced presentation of where Q is today. We only have another minute or so, unfortunately. Our time <laughs> is really questions. tight. But is there, can somebody get in a nice, quick question? Let's put Tim on the spot here. Who can give him a quick question? Hard to see through the light. I apologize for the oh, lack of one, time here. I've got one on the side here. Yes, please. There's a microphone. What, what would be the benefits of becoming a public institution over private? Money. Uh, so that discussion has come down to being all about money. Um, so we're really looking at capital grants, the availability of provincial capital grants, and also um, there's the Alberta Capital Finance Authority that gives loans to public institutions at a very good interest rate, much better than what we can get from a bank. Uh, so we could flip all of our debt in, into that, which would save us a considerable amount of money. There might be ways of getting that anyway without being public. We like who we are <laughs> and we like our board structure the way it is. Um, so if we can achieve the sort of financial security that we're looking for without being public, I think the board might be interested in that. We're trying to, we're talking at the moment. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming. If you have questions, email me at president at concordia.ab.ca.